So I, you know, I feel deeply ashamed. I didn't think of that point which I had. On the other hand, of course, it was an enormous amount of work just to get all that work. And, and maybe I wouldn't have succeeded as well as EJ made it work. But, you know, that's a beautiful piece of work. A lovely synthesis with some lovely ideas embedded in it. And boy, I wish I thought. All right, now we're um, running long, and I know when I sell stories to come. <clears throat> While I was a graduate student, we were visited by people who came and gave lectures about their research. And one of the ones that came while I was a graduate student, in about 1962, was Colin Ebel. Now, Colin was a physical organic chemist. He wasn't a synthetic chemist, he wasn't really interested in organic <coughs> He was interested in physical organic chemistry, measuring reaction rates. And the reaction he came and talked about was this one. He had a female group and a silent group. First sign I'd ever seen of silicon in organic chemistry. So he told us that if you treat this molecule with HPR or HCl, what happens is that it protonates, in other words, of course, it's reactive enough to react with the benzene ring. And very remarkably, completely different from what you learn in first year organic chemistry, it doesn't react ortho, meta, or para, it reacts ipso. It attacks the atom of silicon to give a new cation. And selectively does that. It does it faster than protons attack benzene itself. 10 to the fifth times faster, much faster. So this was a much more amenable reaction for studying rates because it happened at a reasonably fast rate. And he told us that what happens to this is that the counter ion, whatever it is, X minus, will attack the silicon, take it out, and restore the benzene ring without the sun. Think about it, the solar group is coming up with a lead. And that, you'll remember, is the first step of what we're using to convert a trimethyl solar group, a phenylamethyl solar group, into something else. So there's that reaction. I learned about it when I was a graduate student, so it's really an old reaction. Now, Colin talked about this, but what he talked about was the relative rates relative to a substituent effect. So he was interested in the effect of the R group. He wasn't really interested in what the silicon was doing. He was just using it. But he did say, or rather, no, no, he didn't say. That was the trouble. He didn't make the point then, but did later. <laughs> and the point is that that first step going 10,000 times faster, or 100,000 times faster, when it's 10 to the fifth, faster than attacking a benzene, must mean that the silyl group stabilizes the intermediate cation. That's why it attacks him. <coughs> if the proton attacks that carbon, it produces a cation with that silicon carbon bond conjugated to the p orbital. And it'll only do that if it's attacked that carbon, because otherwise the silicon carbon bond's in the plane already. So that was there in what he was talking about, if we had thought about it carefully enough. Now, he didn't draw attention to the fact then and I didn't spot it. In fact, I didn't remember anything about this. But there was a second feature of this reaction that's also really interesting. And that's that we can tell that the silyl group is the group that comes out because this is not reversible. It doesn't lose a proton and go back to the beginning again. It always loses the silyl group and goes on, which is telling us straight away that a silyl group is a better electrofugal group than a proton. And that's wonderful. And that's going to be very important. It became very important to me later on. But at this stage, I didn't pick up on the idea. But something must have been sown. Some seed must have been sown in my mind that I had that thought from those reactions. And they all went out of my mind. But it was there somewhere. All right, well, we're going on. At this point, I left for the United States and worked for Professor Woodward. <coughs> there he is. And uh, while, when I got there, 
uh, that molecule had been made. And the task he gave me and two other people was to synthesize this unsaturated acid. Okay, well, I did eventually it took me about four or five months. I took 17 steps, and the overall <coughs> yield was pretty good. 17%. That's not bad for that many steps. You may, may not look that good, but it is pretty good. And it was beaten later by the other two people who were working on the same project, one of whom, John Murray Lane, is of course an enormously distinguished chemist, uh, and he beat me. I mean, he got 19% in fewer steps, and John Carter's collaboration as well, they were working together. But I got there first. <laughs> <laughs> and with plenty of material. I had, I had a couple of hundred grams of this. And so I was able to join this onto there <coughs> and be the first person to do that. So I joined it on, very neat, I just made the amide there, and then treated that with base to side -tons. Now you can see what's going on here. This is an enolate ion <coughs> being formed next to the ketone as a nucleophile in an intramolecular molecular reaction. And the argument for the real <coughs> now was very, very seriously stereochemically interesting because that center will be controlled and so will that. And I won't go into the argument, but the shape of that bowl-like molecule up there two methyl groups down, is going to determine how those two bonds are formed. And therefore, we should be able to control those two centers. Now, I said at the beginning we didn't try to control stereochemistry. Here, just four or five years later, I'm at the very front of control of stereochemistry. To control four stereo centers in a row like that was unprecedented, or essentially unprecedented. So it was really very remarkable to be able to do that. And I was able to put those two centers in for that moment. But it's a little more complicated than I'm showing you. Because, in fact, I didn't have a single enantiomer over here. I had a receiving mixture. But my alpha beta unsaturated acid chloride was a single enantiomer <coughs> because it came from camphor. So, when I did this reaction, I had a mixture. So I was starting with a mixture of these <coughs> two, and therefore, well, th these are the products I got to the mixture. One of them was the one we wanted, and the other had four of the centers opposite, but the bottom one at the bottom there was the same. That's the same in both, and the others are all opposites. Well, we knew one of these was really important, and later on we were assuming we would be able to resolve the amine, join it all up with the right one, and get it all out. And this was the first time we had four centers in a row, and so it was very exciting, and we wanted to get nice crystals and find out what we got, and so on. So, um, I had a careful chromatography call, I had a great big column, and I put this stuff on it and tried to separate them, and I think I did. Here is my lab notebook. I was recently given this. I didn't keep it, of course, it went to the wood, but eventually came back. Now you can't read it terribly well, but look at this. Here's the chromatography. I had one chromatography that was useless, then I did it all again with a different column, and gradually took off samples here. 10 milligrams, 20, 76, 50. I eventually decided that somewhere around here there was one compound coming off. Then it stopped coming off, and then another one came off. So I was pretty confident I'd got two fractions, and it seemed unlikely that I had anything else other than these two. So there they were, oils in the bottom of the flask. So Woodward came up to see me, it was 11 o'clock at night, as usual. And uh, no, it wasn't actually. No, I've got. Getting what I'm doing. This was so exciting that he actually came up to see me in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up and told me, he said, Well, okay, you've got them apart, they must crystallize. A molecule with that structure must crystallize. It's got nice polar groups and it's very rigid and so on. So he said, Have you scratched it? And I said, Oh, yes, I've scratched it. He said, For how long? And I said, Well, I don't know. He said, No, no, you scratch it until it crystallizes. <laughs> <laughs> you do. And that explains this entry in my book, E crystallized after four hours scratching. <laughs> 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 Inside that 